Praise the Lord. How many love Jesus in here? All right. Amen. I think I'm going to preach some radical stuff this morning. Amen. How many are ready? Uh, thank you, Pastor Campbell, uh, church staff, Tori, his wife, Stacia. Uh, appreciate you guys. Uh, uh, also, uh, I turned 63 in July the 12th. <clears throat> Also, in a couple of days, I'm going to be five years transplanted. <clears throat> this white boy is doing good in the inside. <clears throat> I'm not all pure Hispanic anymore. <clears throat> so, uh, thank God, uh, I turned 63. Uh, Mama Campbell called me, and she says, I heard it's your birthday today, James. He says, uh... I only sing happy birthday to my children, but I'm going to sing happy birthday to you. And she sang happy birthday to me, and, and uh, I, I really love Pastor, I mean, Pastor Campbell and, and Connie. They, they've really been a blessing uh, to me and Christine and to all of us in here. Aren't you glad we still have Pastor Campbell? Praise the Lord. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 37, if you have your Bible. In 1989, I came into the church and I, I got saved. And when I got saved, uh, uh, right away, I made a decision that I was going to live for God. And not just live for God, but be on fire for God. And... The vision and the purpose that God gave me was a passion like I had for the devil, but gave me a passion for the kingdom. And I never looked back. I got in there uh, in the church, and uh, nobody had to follow up on me. In fact, I was probably one of the first ones to come in waiting for Pastor Campbell in the parking lot. Nobody had to tell me to clean up. I just went over there and just started cleaning up the restrooms because I wanted to do something for God. Time went on, and you know how you come into the church with all kinds of baggage. You're a sinner. You know all the drama, the things that you were involved in, the world, the drugs, the alcohol, and so on. And, and I just went in. I said, you know what? This is what I want to do. And this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Uh, I got saved at the age of 29 years old. And like Stacy said, there's a lot of people even that invested in me. Tom Thompson is probably one of the ones, my uh, friend Frank Cooper. A lot of other ones, even George Rose. Bill Moorhead was the only, the only guy that would invite a family of nine to his house and feed him steaks. The only man that would lend us his station, station wagon to go to Disneyland when we finally got a breakthrough on money. There we are like the Clampets, amen, going to California. <laughs> but... It's been a ride, and it has been easy, but one of the things that I made in, uh, made a, in my mind and in my heart is uh, no matter what, that I was going to serve God. And there's a lot of things, amen, that have happened uh, just in the uh, 34 years that I've been uh, saved. Also, you know, it was my spiritual birthday on August the 22nd. And I still remember the, the day that I went up there with Frank Cooper, and he led me to the Lord, and it seems just like yesterday, and life has challenged me to live for God, just like he's, gonna cha he's challenging all of us, especially in the day and the hour that we live in. I I'm going to say something. Jesus is coming back. <clears throat> But in the book of Ezekiel is a, is a text, amen, that we all know. Uh, he's in the valley. But before I, I read the text, uh, when I came in, I was uh, young, 29 years old. I was in my prime, came in with a jerry curl. <clears throat> 
This is why Christine notices me. She looked like Janet Jackson and I looked like Lionel Richie. We don't look like that no more, but it's close. <laughs> Here we are today. But, you know, I did uh, some time in jail after I got saved. I had everything coming my way, going my way. God began to bless me quick, bless me with my children that I abandoned for two years because of crack cocaine. <laughs> Uh, my sister Mary right away gave me a car, a Catalina, clean. And the, the, uh, the job that I had for 10 years that fired me five times gave me a chance to come back when I got saved. And I proved them wrong. And uh, I really started working my way up to be the man that God had called me to be or that God calls us to be. <clears throat> and no doubt, uh, just the fun times. I remember me and Stacy. Stacy got saved about maybe 10 months before I did, almost a year. And we were doing an outreach in Mesa. And me and Stacy were walking by the pond. There's ducks there and everything. And I said, Stacy, one day you're going to preach in my church. And sure enough, when we started pioneering, Stacy Diller was one of the first ones that preached in our congregation, just with a, a handful of people. <clears throat> Life went on. We started playing basketball, uh, got punched in the court, got elbowed by some wicked elbows. Everything is fine and dandy, vibrant, living for God. There's nothing, amen, that I wouldn't trade at the time and still to this day. And not knowing that there was something inside of me that 25 years later was going to cause me to collapse one morning sun, uh, on a Sunday. I started bleeding from all over my body and not knowing that I had cancer in the liver. <clears throat> 25, 27 years it stayed dormant, even though I was doing the thing. Sometimes I would play up to 20 games of basketball a week, just play sports, horseshoes, whatever type of sport. I, I, I love sports. But not knowing him and that there was something in me that was killing me not even knowing. Something that I probably should have checked a long time ago. You know how we don't go visit the doctors. But it was in there and it uh, caused me to collapse and just barely making it to the hospital. You know, there's a lot of things, if we're not careful, that we don't check ourselves. And in the long run, if we're not careful, it kills us spiritually. And I had seven weeks to live when I went into the doctor. She says, you only had a month and a little more to live by the way your liver was when we took it all out. I'm going to show you a picture um, right before the last service that I. This is a picture where it was a last service. I couldn't, I couldn't even make it to church anymore after that service right there. <clears throat> there was something in me that was killing me little by little. And not even knowing. One of the strategies from hell is from you and I, and even the church, is to kill you and I little by little. 
The other day, Pastor te uh, texted me. He said, James, uh, I'm in pain. Pray for me. I'm sick of the pain. And I mentioned one thing to him. I said, Pastor, slow death is a torment. And when I thought about that, I remembered about this picture. And not only is slow death, amen, a torment, spiritually slow death is a torment. That if we're not careful, there's something, amen, that we haven't checked in the inside that is killing you and I. And I use this, amen, to minister on the valley of dry bones. I'm going to read the text very quickly, and then I'm going to move on to the sermon. Verse 37, verse number 1. And the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones, and he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And indeed, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. And again he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thou sayest the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put snooze on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you. And the Bible says, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied, or other words, so I prayed as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. Oh, yeah. And suddenly a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to bone. And indeed, as I looked, I mean, the snooze in the flesh came upon them. And the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. So he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man. And say to the breath, thou sayest the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on the slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived. And the Bible says, amen, that they stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Let's pray. Father, by the Holy Ghost, God, I pray that you would move by your spirit. God, raise us to be this great, exceedingly army in these last days. God, I pray, minister, those, amen, in here that need miracles, those that you need to breathe upon, whether it's spiritually, physically, could even be sickness, I pray, breathe right now in the Holy Ghost. And I prophesy and I pray. And we all pray that you would visit us tonight, this morning. I pray in Jesus' name, not my will, but your will be done in this place and in this assembly in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look at the assignment uh, this morning. Uh, in our text, amen, a lot of us, uh, probably even pastors, preached on this text before. But Israel has been taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And the reason why is the result of their sin, idol worship. Now the Bible says that they're under bondage. Bible says that they lost their land, their livelihood, even lost the temple. They're in an impossible situation where they find themselves in this valley dried up. They're in captivity. 
a state even of depression, hopelessness. Seems like there's no more future for them. And God uses these dry bones as an analogy to explain the spiritual state of a nation of Israel. They were dry. It's like no life. Let me say something in here. This is what the devil wants the church and you and I this morning. They were dry where there's no life in them whatsoever. Not just dead bodies, amen, but, amen, bodies that needed, amen, a move of God and a touch of God or even God breathing on them again. Verse number three, then he asked me, Son of man, can these bones become living people again? And he goes and he says, oh, sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that one translation. And God tells him to prophesy to this dark valley of hopeless people. This text is not talking about you and I. How I many know we're all saved in here? And I hope it's not, but if you are going through something in here, God's going to touch you. If you are sick in body and you need a miracle in here, I believe God can breathe on you and resurrect you this morning in the name of Jesus. Let's give God a clap off. Let's wake up in here. <clears throat> We're talking about the church on an assignment. John 5, 1 John 5, 4, for every child of God defeats this evil world, and we have achieved this victory through our faith. Then the apostle Paul, amen, goes on and says, amen, in Romans 8, 37, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Not even death, how many know, can take away our hope in here this morning. <clears throat> First Thessalonians 4.13, bear with me because I'm going to break down, amen, before I get into four valleys that I want to talk about. That if we're not careful, amen, can put us, amen, in a valley of dry bones. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, and now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. I'm telling you, we got some hope in here this morning. But these bones in the valley cannot represent you and I because we're alive and we're saved, amen, bought, amen, by the precious blood of Jesus, just like Stacy said. There's no reason why God's people should be in the valley of dry bones. 1 Corinthians 5.22, for as Adam all die, so also in Christ all should be made alive. And I'm here to tell you, amen, that there's victory in the cross. I'm here to tell you, amen, that there's victory in your salvation if you allow God to move, amen, help you and use you. See, we're all alive in Christ, and we're all more than conquerors through the power in the Holy Ghost. How many know these bones represent the bondage or a bond, amen, uh, those of a need of a Savior? And no doubt, amen, we live in a society and in a world that they're in a valley of decisions, multitudes and multitudes in the valley of decisions, amen. But the, but the question is, amen, is the church on the assignment for that? He was taken into a valley, and he was taken to a valley, biblically speaking about valleys they, that represent hardship. Dark times. Psalms 23, 4, even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort, comfort me. Let's look at valley number one in here, the Valley of Elah. <clears throat> uh, you know the whole story, amen, is the valley, the Valley of Elah represents itself as the valley of conflict. 
and no doubt, amen, if you're gonna if you're gonna live for God, there's always gonna be conflict. You're always going to be in this valley of conflict, especially if you're going to pastor and pioneer a church. 1 Samuel 17, 2, And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in the battle array against the Philistines. Can I say something? The devil it just ain't going to give you free ground. And here, amen, you know the whole thing about the Philistines, amen. They were always coming against the people of God. You know, I started thinking about the Valley of Conflict. You know, I've been pastoring that church for 25 years, and it hasn't been easy to pioneer that church. I was talking to Ron Myers. There's specific people, amen, specific men, amen, that can preach in different and specific locations, and how many know uh, Glendale in the city of Phoenix, amen, that's a capital of murder. There's demons, amen. When we come into Chandler, amen, we don't even feel there's no demons up here. But you get off on I-10 and 50, uh, 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 51st Avenue, amen, and you begin to feel murder. You feel, begin to sorcery, witchcraft, uh, curanderas. I'm talking about everything, amen, that is surrounded in that city, amen. And I'm telling you, the devil, amen, has not given us, amen, a free will to just build that church for free. I remember building it and... <clears throat> we were in a play, we were in a time, amen, where God was moving. Uh, we uh, uh, pioneered in the living room. We would take out the chairs and uh, put a stand, put a, uh, the pulpit there, break down, put it back up, break down. I remember putting posters on the corner from King Coe's uh, uh, 15 by 20 with a stick. When I went back out there, the sticks were uh, broken, tore up and everything. Ain't nobody wanted to come to church. But yet, I would go back and make some more, and I would have church again. And I'd have church again. Hello? And I didn't just start Bible study. Come on, somebody. I went Sunday morning service, and I almost had Sunday school because Christine was in there. <laughs> Hello? I, I didn't wait, amen. I went full board. I put the schedule up there. Sunday morning prayer, Sunday morning service. Oh, I'm preaching in here. Wednesday night service. It doesn't matter what I had. Saturday night outreach. Just with me and Christine. Well, how did you do it? Well, I put a cassette with Ernie Toppins out in the parking lot. And I almost, amen, did a Villy Manili one time. Oh, man of God. <laughs> Can I say something? Listen to me, preacher, pioneer worker. If you're not going to go full out, amen, you ain't building nothing. God was moving, begin to fill the house. Listen, God knows the attention of the heart. He knows if you're hungry for souls. He knows, amen, your assignment, if your assignment, amen, has to do with his will, his purpose. I'm trying to encourage you, pioneer worker. I'm trying to encourage you, a pastor in here. If you're going to build the church, amen, you're going to have to go through conflict. Uh, you're going to have to believe God. You're going to have to trust God. Uh, trust God with people. Trust God with money. Trust God for your city. You're going to have to pray. You're going to have to believe. Believe God, you're going to have to trust God. Uh, listen, Christine was a city girl. I said, hold on, I'm going to go outreach. I said, stay in here. I left her in the truck, and there's this homeless guy. All he wanted was a dollar, but Christine thinks he's trying to break in and mess her up. I remember one time our church began to grow. We began to see God move. Uh, we went into the building. We filled up the first building, 1,800 square feet. We're on a move. God's rolling. God's moving. On the second building, I remember God speaking to me. You're going to cast out devils. There's witchcraft over here. 
And for a whole season, we begin to cast out devils. God began to multiply the church uh, from 30 to 90 people just in a period of three months. Amen. We were hungry, but I mean, you know, the devil doesn't give ground freely. Listen to me, preacher, and listen to me, young pastor. You're going to have to go full board. Even, amen, when the devil comes right at you, you're going to have to, amen, believe God. You're going to have to trust God. Don't back up. I remember there was a biker. He was living next door, and he shouldn't even have been there. He had a big old beard. Uh, there was no showers in the commercial buildings and everything. And he, he came out one day. The disciples were outside on a Saturday morning, and he had some boxing gloves. And he said, I'll put, I'll put, who's ne who wants to be first? So I don't know what's going on. I'm in the inside. I'm trying to get everything ready for outreach. We're going to go save some souls. We're going we're gonna to believe and trust God. And when I walk out, uh, one of the disciples came and said, there's a biker out there. He's going crazy. He wants to fight. Nobody wants to fight him. So I go back outside and I say, hey, what's going on here? I say, you're the preacher? He said, I want you. I said, you don't want me. I'll knock you out. <laughs> <laughs> I said to myself, did I just say that? <laughs> there was another time we were, we were getting set up for the night time and there was a the Crips moved in about two, two, uh, two uh, uh, doors down, and I went outside, and he had all the, the parking lot taped up, trying to take my parking lot. <clears throat> and I said, what's going on here? And he, he was a bigger black guy, had uh, a jerry curl on him and everything, had some, had some sweats. He'd been in the back of his sweats. He had a big old hole back here. And I said, this ain't going to happen, man. We're going to have church. He said, no, you ain't going to have church. This is my night. I said, no, it's not. This is my night. So I begin to take, I begin to take the tape off. <clears throat> and uh, I don't know where all these black brothers came, but there was about 500 that came in the parking lot. <laughs> They're carrying guns and everything into the building and every and uh, uh, and I say no, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have church. You ain't blocking it. So we started arguing, me and him, and he's in the back over there, back of his Cadillac, and he tells me, preacher, I hit hard, and I and I gave him the word. You know how you, you defeat the devil by the word. I said, read your Bible. God knocked down the walls of Jericho with one punch. See, you always got to use the, the word to defeat the devil. How many you know that? So the whole thing is we had Saturday night, and we didn't give up no ground, and we were going to have some church, and to this day we're still having church. So this is how the devil works. He encamps uh, his strategy of conflict. Conflict, I mean, as you move on, uh, even conflict inside of the church, conflict with people. Your own people. People that sometimes leave. And say stuff. You know what I've learned about that type of conflict lately? It says sometimes us preachers need to just check ourselves too. Because we always want to, oh, it's them, it's them, it's them. But in reality, man, like God speaks, is it, it, could it be something inside of me also? That all conflict, amen, is probably a part of how, amen, we handle situations in the church, preacher. Listen, I'm trying to help you because I've learned some things on my own. 
This is the same valley where David killed Goliath. It was a battle of conflict, the battle of Elah. Then we have the second valley, the valley of Achor, the valley of consequences. How many know, amen, that if we're not careful, amen, when we, amen, do things, amen, that are not lined up with the word of God and God himself, amen, how many know we reap consequences? Joshua 6, 26, and they raised over him a great heap of stones uh, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor. Well, there's consequences for you and I when we make decisions. Can I say something? Because somebody hurts you doesn't mean you bail out. Because if you're not careful, there's consequences, amen, that you pay, not at the moment, but in the long run. And I learned that my own self. Consequences. I began to think, maybe I could have done things better. And probably I learned to do them better. But consequences, I mean, yeah, listen, listen to me, disciple, listen to me, man of God. Where you lead your family, it has to be lined up with the word of God. Because if not, amen, how many of the devil amen doesn't play? It was David that at the moment he probably didn't even think, amen, of the consequences, amen, that he was going to pay with his own family. In a time, amen, in a decision that he had to make, amen, he looks at the top of his balcony, amen, a place, amen, where he didn't have to be. And yet he looks down and he looks at this beautiful woman, and from that point, there's consequences that he's going to pay that lead from one curse to another curse and all the way to his children. See, the same mistakes that you make, your kids always make those same mistakes. If you don't believe me, just read the history of David. David. Number three, I'm going to finish quick because I believe God wants to help people. You are going to battle, amen, these, concert, these uh, valleys in your, in, in your life as you pastor. I mean, no, we're living in a generation, amen, of LGBT. That's even trying to take our kids, teach our kids. And if we're not careful, amen... We can just fit right into that valley without making a stand. The valley of Syria, the valley of corruption, the Bible says. This is where Sodom and Gomorrah were located. These are valleys, amen, where people are living in right now. And yet the church has no voice. The church, amen, has no assignment. Instead, if we're not careful, the church is living in the valley itself. Dried up, no passion, no zeal, like Stacy said, zeal has eaten me up. Amen, the Bible says, has eaten me up. And we sit here, amen, and we begin to, amen, move on this casual Christianity. Where there's no more conviction, no more passion. Listen, I don't consider myself to be a professional preacher. Never want to be a professional preacher because I believe that passion overrides professionalism. I've already probably made some mistakes on some words. This is where Sodom and Gomorrah were located. The valley had slimy pits. 
Genesis 14:10. Now the valley of Siddim was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. Social media. Somebody talking about TikTok. Uh, you, you, you know our assignment is on the phones and not on the harvest. Uh, how, many, how many know that? Everything is about technology. Everything is about the phone. Everything is about texting new converts. Everything is about now calling and steady men of gold, visiting them, an old-fashioned revival, an old-fashioned meal. Amen. I'm still with it. Uh, Stacy, I'm going to go a little further than that. Amen. I'm going to go tacos de lengua. Tacos de tripa. Crunchy to the bone. That'll hook up a new convert quick. In Jesus' name. When he eats that taco de tripa, he'll be speaking name in tongues in Jesus' name. Come on, church. Think about it. For 27 years, there was things, amen, that there was that one, amen, disease that was eating me up. The church world is being eaten up, amen, by a, a spiritual disease, amen, a materialism, amen. There's no world evangelism. The church is staying inside of the four walls, amen. They're not turning the city upside down for Jesus. World evangelism is the one that turns the city upside down for Jesus, amen. The ones, amen, that go from house to house to house. Nobody want to do follow up no more. <laughs> like Pocky said, we got our we got our little uh, recliner. Don't bother me. And I'm telling you, when we don't when we don't check up on them, I'm telling you, in 24 hours, the devil got him back where he wants him. Because the church is comfortable and is living in the comfort zone. Well, it costs too much money, Pastor. It costs too much. It costs my time. It takes me out of my comfort zone. I really want to do this and that. Amen. But like Stacy said, you don't belong to your own yourself no more. You belong to the kingdom of God, amen. God's got you, Mark. He's got a number on you. It ain't the 666 number. I'm telling you, if we would just go out, you know, we, we, you know, we all think, amen, that, that these folks can't get saved. They can get saved. But the reason they're not getting saved, because the church is just standing back. LGP got fear on you. You fear them. Are you still with me in here? You got that fear. I ain't gonna, oh, uh, uh. I don't tell it like it is in here. There ain't no different, amen, if you're uh, uh, gonna witness to a vato loco just because they're gay. Gays can get saved too, homeless can get saved too. We just want, we just want to hit the people, amen, that you think, amen, oh, that'd be a new convert. No, you'd be surprised, amen, that if you, if, you, if you pray for somebody that you think, amen, might not even have a destiny or a purpose or a calling, those are the ones, man, God uses the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. I read a story the other day, and this, preach, this preacher uh, was saying that he would pastor these homeless guys. And, and his whole deal said, well, they'll never get saved. And he would see them every day by the church. He would pass by them, and God would always tell him, witness to them. And he said, no, 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 they're homeless. You know the ones we want to put in the back seat over there? Well, 
Well, you can't build on those type of gods. I said, God build on you. You were homeless spiritually. You weren't even married. You didn't even have no kids when you came in. Was I the only homeless one that came in here? I was kicked to the curb. And God says, witness to them. Witness. And he witnessed to a, the, a, a one homeless guy. He comes to church, gets saved. Radically, he gets saved. He begins to dress up. He begins to shower. He begins to even put a tie. And not only that, amen, God begins to, amen, have him be a witness to his homies out there. And he begins to witness to his other friends, the homeless guys, the ones that are still drinking, the ones that haven't taken a shower. And he goes out, hey, listen, look what God has done for me. And by the time, amen, six months went by, all seven homeless guys were saved and delivered and set free and dressed in the right mind. True story. But how many know the church just sits back? Don't know those type of people. I'm glad somebody witnessed to me. I'm glad somebody witnessed to AJ. Hello? Because we wouldn't be here. It's like Ron was telling me, he said, James, you never know what God can do in a person's life. We look at him as slimy, living in pits, but yet God looks at him differently. The Valley of Ishkal is a valley of choice. Numbers 32, verse number 9, for when they went up to the Valley of Ishkal and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the heart of the people of the children of Israel. So they did not go into the land which the Lord had given them. See, there, you know, when you're going to live for God, you have to make choices who you're going to listen to. Are you still with me in here? Uh, can I say something? It's good that you don't hang around with a gossiper. Can I tell it like it is? It's good. It's good to not hang around when somebody's going to be talking about your pastor. Because how many know pastor does love you? Just like I love you guys in here. These are choices, and because they heard ten spies, it discouraged them, and they missed, amen, the will of God. And for 40 years... They wandered in the wilderness just because somebody discouraged them. The valley of choice. You're going to have to make up your mind. Who are you going to listen to? And one of the best voices, like Pocky said, you can listen to is the voice of God. We can give God a clap offering in him. <laughs> the valley of Kidron is number five, and that's the valley of crushing or a cemetery. Dead. I mean, a lot of us were dead in our sins when we came in the church. Dead with drugs, alcohol, whatever you want to say. Second Kings 23, 6. And he brought out the wooden image from the house of the Lord to the brook Kindred outside Jerusalem. Burned it at the brook, brook Kindred and, and ground it into ashes. And he threw his ashes of the graves of the common people. <clears throat> There's going to be some crushing moments in you and I. How I many know that? I remember uh, living for God. I could have so easily got twisted at 2.30 in the morning when I got that call that my boy was no longer alive. At that moment, I had to make a decision. 
At the moment, was I going to get bitter? I mean, you know, there's going to be crushing moments in your life, and it's how you process it, amen. It's what's going to keep you alive and living for God. And there was a lot of things that I could have probably would have went back to the old nature and lived like the Old Testament and killed some folks. But yet, amen, this is where God, amen, spoke to me. He said, vengeance is mine, says God. I will repay. Just leave it up to me, amen. Don't get twisted. Don't, don't, get, don't let this crushing, amen, spirit, amen, get a hold of you and make you backslide and lose your, lose your salvation. It was a time, amen, where I had to check myself if I was going to let this thing crush me and take me out. Or even put me in a cemetery. You know, one of the strategies of hell, amen, is try to kill you and I. How I many know that? I remember I was sitting on a one night. I had preached a sermon on the, on the midnight hour of the midnight cry. And when I got done with that sermon, it, I really felt like God speak to me that he was going he, he to send a friend at midnight. And I told the church after the service, it's probably one of my last services that I, that I preached there. I said, God, God's going to give me a liver at midnight. One night, me and Christine were, were in, in, in the room, and it was a different night. And I totally, you know, forgot about the sermon that I preached. <clears throat> But it, it was a different night. It, there was something, in, where the lights were on, but it was bright. And I really felt the presence of God there. And at 12.05, I got a call. He said, don't go to sleep. Your liver's here. And I called the guys in the church. The church uh, has a proof of this that I told the whole church, God's going to bring me a liver at midnight, and he did. Amen. You know, I'm sitting there for, for months, and you know, I love Christine very much. She, I believe she's the only one that can put up with me, really, besides Pastor Campbell. <laughs> But when I'm dying, when, when I'm, I'm this slow death is a torment. And you're believing God, you, you're, you're at your last, even the smell of decay is coming out of my breath. But not one time did I really think I was going to die. I'm just living life. I'm moving on. Not one time did I tell Christina, I said, hey, listen, there's three brothers. If I die, you better not marry these three brothers. <laughs> <laughs> didn't because I wasn't going to let this thing crush me I wasn't going to let this thing take me to the cemetery I wasn't ready to be buried I remember my daughter Brittany Boo she says dad dad you need to do you, you need to do a will who's going to keep your cars and who's going to keep the house and everything And I said, boo, if I do a will, I'm signing my death certificate. So you get nothing for right now. <laughs> See, it's all about if you want to live in the valley or you're going to live for God. And I was talking to Pastor Campbell and <clears throat> when uh, I got out of the eight hour surgery, uh, I, I got up, and the first thing I seen was uh, 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 Pastor Tory and Pastor Campbell. And my daughter made a statement uh, to me. She's not saved, and 
She says, I couldn't believe it. She's still, she still struck by it that Pastor Campbell could sing hymns for 30 minutes before I woke up. And, and uh, you know, Pastor, he's good for pictures. He's good. He's taking pictures. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pretty good. Uh, uh, raising from the dead and everything. <laughs> <laughs> and then he sends them to me. <laughs> and I said, oh, Pastor, man, can you believe somebody had to die for me so I can live? And uh, that was one sermon for him. <laughs> oh, Pastor, man, do you believe I have to carry this white boy for the rest of my life? <laughs> And the whole thing was, who are you carrying? Who are you dying for so somebody can live? And this is why I'm alive today, because somebody had to die for me. So I could live. Two days ago, we're talking. And we said, man... Pastor Roman Gutierrez ain't got nothing on us. <laughs> so I'm going to make a flyer like this one right here. <laughs> Two almost dead but are alive. I told Pastor, Pastor said, oh, those are two handsome men right there. I said, I don't know about that picture, Pastor, but when we dressed up, we might, we might make that. <laughs> but, but think about it. Can I say something to you this morning? If you're, if you're in a valley right now, God loves you. As long as you're breathing in here, God's not done with you. God's not done with those two men right there. Are you still with me in here? <laughs> hey, Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave in here. And I'm telling you, listen to me. And I, and I told Pastor, I said, man, listen to me, Pastor. You're, you're, you're a miracle. Uh, um, uh, listen, I don't know if it I told Pastor, I'm not going to get religious like, like old Stacy said. But uh, I thought that was an angel that raised him from the dead specific time know what to do how many know if it was one of us we couldn't know how to break a rib not unless we use a bat or something but think about it and I told pastor I said you know what God's not wasn't done with me and he ain't done with you and can I say something in here God's not done with you God's not done with you and if you're in here, you need a miracle this morning. If you're sick in body, the devil's telling you that you're going to die. Like he told me a lot of times at night. I said, I didn't kill you before. I'm killing you now, though. I said, but God got the last word in here. As long as you're still alive and you're breathing, God can still do the miracle in here. And he can take you out of the valley of dry bones. And I'm going to prophesy. Prophesy, Ezekiel. Can they live? Yeah, you can live in there this morning in Jesus' name. Let's give God a clap offering in there. You can live. Prophesy. Tell him. Only you know, Lord. Only Lord. Only the King of kings uh, and the Lord of lords can cause us to live and have breath and the Spirit of God, amen, to dwell inside of you and I. Let's give God a clap offering in there. Uh, don't you love Jesus in him? <laughs> 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 
Hey, listen, 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 listen. God don't care if you pioneered before and you're in here. Amen. Don't let him keep you in that valley. God still loves you. Amen. I'm telling you, you're a champion in the eyes of God. You haven't failed. Amen. You gave it your best. Amen. You fought. You believed. You trusted God. Amen. And God will never give up on you. Amen. They just got a clap offering. Oh, yeah. There's people sick in here. Don't let the devil lie to you because I believe God, amen, can breathe on that sickness, amen, and cause it to be resurrected this morning. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close and tell you, amen, that God is not done with you in here. And he's going to help you. He's going to resurrect you. He's going to build your church, preacher. Amen. I'm telling you, amen, we're, we're, we're in the greatest revival that's about to happen. While this whole world is dying, Jesus is going to bring the book of Joel, amen, to life, amen. In the last days, amen, I'm going to pour out my spirit, amen, unto mankind. And I'm going to cause the greatest revival. You're in the greatest revival. You're in the greatest church. You're in the greatest conference. God is God. God is the King of Kings. And he's the Lord of Lords. Amen. And he wants to help us. He wants to resurrect us. He wants to give us life. Amen. No more dry bones. God's going to bring life. Let's bow our heads. God, we love you and we thank you. Devil, you're a liar. Before I move any uh, forward, amen, I want to pray for you. If you're in here, you're not saved, you're not born again, maybe you find yourself in that valley where you're hopeless, you have no hope. Seems, amen, that life is just, amen, a bummer, like I ain't going nowhere, I'm tormented. I'm tired of this drug, this addiction, whatever you're going through, maybe even suicidal in here. Can I say something? Don't do it. God loves you. Say, Pastor, Pastor Campbell, I need a I need God to breathe on me. I need the Holy Ghost. I need a miracle this morning. And if that's you, I want you to do one thing, amen. I don't even want you to lift up your hand. I want you to just get up out of your seat, and I want you to meet me up here. And I'm gonna, we're going to lead you, amen, to the king, to the savior that wants to save you so quickly. Would you move up? Maybe your back's leaning hard. Would you come up quickly, quickly? There's people in here. You're not right with Jesus, and you want to get right. You need to get right. We're living in the last days. God wants to have mercy on you. Quickly, get up. Don't worry about your neighbor. Don't worry about nobody. Humble yourself. Come up. Come up. Come up. Come up. Come up. Come back, prodigal son. Time's running out. Jesus still loves you. He doesn't hate what you've done. He died for what you've done. Yes, there's more. Come on. Get up. Get up. I believe there's people in here. Come on. Get up. Get up. Secret sin. You're not living right. You're tormented. And you need a miracle. I'm going to change the order around to the church. Are we really on the assignment of God? Have we really drawn back? Because there's people in the valley of decisions, multitudes as I speak in the valley of decision. That if the church, amen, is not on the assignment in world evangelism, witnessing, a lamp burning to your city, people will perish. And if we're not careful, we'll probably even miss the greatest revival if the church is not on the assignment. It's about people this morning. I'm going to open the altar. Would you allow God? Maybe you're in a place right now where the devil is tormenting you. And God wants to breathe on you this morning. He wants to help you. Powerful messages from Pastor Stacy Dillard on the temple. Pocky Raj. The presence of God, the voice of God. And I want you to get up out of your seat.
and I want you to cry out. Maybe you're struggling in here this morning, tormented in your mind, you're, ba you're battling sickness and infirmity, and God wants to heal you right now. Don't give up. Said, I'm not living in the valley. I'm going to allow God to breathe on me. I'm going to allow God to move. Prophesy, begin to pray, begin to prophesy to the sickness and the infirmity. And be, say, God, resurrect me. Give me some resurrection life. Uh, give me purpose all over again. Let's begin to pray, church. Let's begin to pray. Let's begin to prophesy. God is not done with us. God is not done with you. The prodigals have won. The devil's a liar. He God, we love you. We love you. We love you. Begin to prophesy to that torment. Begin to prophesy against it, to that sickness. Devil, you're a liar. Loose him and let him go right now. To drive God help me alive. begin to prophesy God, for your backslidden children those that are lost without God uh, begin to speak their name uh, God help them uh, God take them out of that valley of dry bones of hopelessness we call out to dry bones come alive This mercy, God of unrelenting love, yeah. rescue Dana every Let's all stand, church. Let's all stand. Let the Holy Ghost keep touching you right now. If you need to keep praying, pray. Yeah, Let's sing it out, church, with your hands lifted up. Come on. We need God. We need the Holy Ghost. We need the presence of the living God. Yeah. We call out to dead hearts, come alive, come alive. A pound of the ashes, let us see an army. Yeah. La Lori Balanda, la Malanda. Dala Malori Balanda, we love you, Jesus. Yeah, la Malor. Dala Malor. Yeah, la Malor. A powder of the ashes, let us see an army rise. We call out. To dry boats come alive. Let's give him a clap off in church. Let's tell him we love him. God, we love you. Yala la malori balanda la la balanda la la ba yala malo yeah God we love you come on church give him a clap offering tell him you love him God is here God is visiting us yeah yeah la malori balanda la la malori balanda la la ba. Dala Malori Balanda la la balara balanda la la balanda Yala la Malori Balanda la la balanda la la ba
Yes, let's give God a clap offering. Yes, let's give God a clap offering. Halamalorobosha. Halabasha Baba Balorobosha. Halabasha Baba Balorobosha. Oh God, Halabasha. All I can say, don't give up. Put your hand to the plow. Don't you even dare to look back. I'm telling you, we're going to see probably one of the greatest revival in history. Thank you, Pastor Campbell. Thank you, guys. Gabe, if you can...